When by his own hand, Richard Nixon lost his presidency, lost its power, pride, and glory, many believed that Nixon would never be heard from again. Well, that hasn't been the case. While he has kept a low profile, his successors have on occasion relied on his insight and expertise. Most recently, President Reagan, before his controversial trip to Europe, sought Richard Nixon's advice. And Nixon has just published his fifth book since his resignation. It's called No More Vietnams. But has time changed Richard Nixon? Well, recently, Barbara visited him in his New York office. Richard Nixon surrounds himself with mementos. Pictures of Mrs. Nixon, happy in China, of his four grandchildren, one by daughter Tricia and three by daughter Julie. His eldest granddaughter, Jenny, the image of her mother, in an Easter hat purchased by Nixon. A piano player and his fans. On a corner table, time stands still. Old magazines with pictures of the Nixons during their White House days. In these unpretentious surroundings, we talked about President Reagan's visit this week to the cemetery at Bitburg. Sir, would this have happened in your administration? I, I guess what I'm asking is, how does a thing like this happen? You've been in the White House. How do you get into this, uh, this uh, situation of such mistakes? Well, uh, I must say, uh, I've made my mistakes, or, <laughs> as we're quite aware, uh, and ones that were much more devastating from a personal standpoint than this is going to be to President Reagan. Uh, these things happen sometimes. What has happened here is it's a tragedy of... Uh, uh, basically misunderstandings, misconceptions, tragedy of errors, perhaps. But once Chancellor Cole did it, made the, gave the invitation, once President Reagan accepted it, then for Chancellor Cole to withdraw it, apparently he was not willing to do that uh, because he thought it would hurt him at home. And for President Reagan to say then, whatever you do, Chancellor, I'm not coming, I think it would have a devastating effect on him. Why? Well, because... Let's face it, as you look at the Germans today, uh, they are the strongest ally we've got in Europe. Without Germany, NATO is nothing. Uh, Germany is the only European nation that the Russians fear. Without the Germans, there is no way you could hold the line in Western Europe. No way. And you Unless you nuke them. Did you call the president or oh, did no, he no, call no. you? No, I, having been in that office, I don't call him. He calls me, usually. And in this instance, uh, the call came from Don Regan's office from, uh, from him to ask for my advice about yeah. the thing. Sir, do you talk to the White House on a regular basis? No. Uh, I generally prefer to send my advice uh, when it's requested in writing. You know, I find that unless you discipline yourself to write, uh, you, you talk too much. May I ask if you have been invited to the White House? And if you were to a state dinner or something... Would you go? Well, of course, we were invited to the, uh, to the White House uh, on the occasion of the, when the three presidents made that historic trip to Sadat's funeral. Yes. Uh, we have not been invited to a social engagement since, uh, but I don't think it's any affront. And as far as going is concerned, you know, President Reagan made a very interesting comment. He, went up when there was a big, when the environmentalists in California, the Sierra Club were after him about doing something about the sequoias. He said, well, when you've seen one sequoia, you've seen them all. And I could say that when you've seen one state dinner, you've seen them at all. <laughs> we have no particular desire Sorry, to go back okay. again. Let us now turn our attention, sir, to the Soviet Union. The Russians have refused to apologize uh, for the shooting death of Major Nicholson in East Germany, and yet we talk about a summit. What should we do? There will be a summit during President Reagan's second term, and there should be. Uh, but it is one that should be well prepared. Uh, as I have put it, uh, when the two powers meet, there's going to be enormous attention to it, paid to it. And uh, a summit, if I may paraphrase, uh, cannot labor and produce a mouse. Let's disabuse ourselves of this sort of silly notion. Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if Gorbachev and Reagan could just get together and meet each other and know each other? because each would charm the other. We would find that our differences weren't all that great. And then after they had completed the meeting, they would shake hands and go home and live happily ever afterwards. Bologna. Now that doesn't happen even with friends, and it seldom, seldom does. And it certainly doesn't happen with potential adversaries. What we're really saying here, the tension between the United States and the Soviet Union is not a problem to which there's a solution. 
The tension which exists between our two countries is a permanent condition. It can be alleviated, but it cannot be cured. What do you think of the president's decision to have an embargo against uh, Nicaragua? I support it. I do not think that that will be adequate in terms of uh, getting the Nicaraguans to cut their ties to the Soviet bloc, getting them to give up some of the repression. Won't it push them even further into the Soviet arms? Uh, the same argument was made, Barbara, you recall, I'm sure you, well, I'm old enough to recall, the same argument was made with Castro. I was around in uh, 1959. Did. And it did And, push and what happened is that Castro didn't need a push. He was already there. The idea that Ortega, this very intelligent, very tough fellow who was over giving an abrazo to Mr. Gorbachev, uh, it will be pushed into the Soviet arms is ridiculous. He is a dedicated Marxist-Leninist, just as Castro was. And as far as that's concerned, uh, the idea that if we follow policies that are too tough with him, he's going to become more pro-Soviet is ridiculous. He's there already. Let me make one thing clear. I do not think that our goal should be to overthrow the government. That isn't going to happen. The Contras aren't strong enough to do that. The, our goal should be to bring enough pressure on that government that they and their own interest will have no choice but to give up on their foreign adventures. When you wrote in your book about Vietnam, you said we won't get over the Vietnam syndrome until we stop uh, using this intellectual junk food. What do you mean by intellectual junk food? By intellectual junk food, what I was referring to uh, was the whole uh, uh, orgy uh, that we have been exposed to in the past few weeks. You know, I, uh, I watch a little more television than I used to. As you know, it's not my favorite medium. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm not their favorite. Just give the news, please. But sir. on the other hand, uh, I would say that as far as that is concerned, uh, we have been inundated with this hand-wringing about Vietnam. And we see these happy Vietnamese women, girls, riding their bicycles through Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, and we hear how wonderful it is there and so forth. Uh, we hear that as a result of our leaving, that now... Uh, things are moving better. Well, they're not. Now, what I mean is that that's intellectual junk food. What we have to do is to hear the truth about what has happened, and then we will realize that we must not let that happen again, not in Nicaragua or anyplace else. Since you brought it up, sir, why don't you like television? Well, television is a medium uh, that I think, in terms of the kind of discussion we have now, uh, is not one that allows for the kind of, uh, of, uh, of really consideration and depth that we need. Mm -hmm. Now, your program does it to an extent, but, but you're the first to admit that if you were to ask me, now, what do you think about Star Wars, Mr. President? I can't answer in one minute. I could, but it would be, frankly, intellectual junk food. Uh, it wouldn't be a real substantive answer. Uh, as you know, the attention span is very small. In fact, I'm probably being cut off now because I'm talking too long. <laughs> <laughs> you may very well be. I'll go on to the next to the next question. I cannot sit with you and not talk about politics because it's just too much fun to do it with you. <laughs> Look ahead, if you will, with me and tell me what you see as the winning ticket for the Republicans. The winning presidential ticket for the Republicans. The way I look at 1988 is this. At the present time, if the economy holds up and is good in 1988, George Bush will be nominated and he will be elected. If the economy does not hold up, George Bush will go down with Reagan's popularity, and then there will be someone else. Kemp? Possibly Jack, Jack Kemp, Kemp. Yeah. provided Jack Kemp is able to separate himself from the Reagan policies, uh, which would be difficult, because I don't think he would want to do that, because I think he believes in uh, the, the Reagan policies. But if the economy goes down, then you would probably see a Democrat winning. As far as the second spot in the ticket is concerned, I think you're more likely to see a woman on the Republican ticket than on the Democratic ticket. The Democrats have tried and been burned. Now, that is no reflection on Mrs. Ferraro. Uh, it just happened she ran at the wrong time on the wrong ticket. Uh, Mondale's going to lose anyway, but as far as the Republicans are concerned, they'll be writing on a blank page. And the Republicans are weaker among women uh, than they should be. I think the possibility of a Republican, be it Either Bush or Kemp uh, picking a woman is quite, quite high. Jean yeah. Kirkpatrick, everybody's saying perfect choice, vice presidential candidate. She, uh, she is certainly eloquent, uh, and uh, uh, 
She has great support among the conservatives, mm -hmm. the hawks, and the, among the Republicans. You think it's a good idea? The question is, the question, yeah. I can answer that question better to see how she conducts herself when she gets out there under the fire of the press and so forth in non-foreign policy issues. Uh, nobody knows how you run on that fast course until you've been there. Uh, I would say at the present time, Mrs. Dole uh, would perhaps have a better chance even than Jane Kirkpatrick. Mm -hmm. now, do you want to go to the Democrats? Sure. I would say first that uh, Gary Hart, I thought after hearing him at the Democratic Convention that he was finished because it was sour grapes. But he conducted himself very well during the campaign. He has recovered. He is a formidable candidate for the nomination. Uh, in his case, however, he some way he's got to warm up. Uh, he's, uh, he, he just doesn't seem to have the, uh, uh, the warmth that he, he comes through too cold to me. Uh, I, I, and this is no pun, he really needs a heart transplant. <laughs> I think, however, that the man that is most likely to be nominated is Cuomo. If he wins a landslide victory in New York, which I think he will, then he will be very hard to stop. What about Ted Kennedy? Well, I know that he's slimming down again for a race, but the, the trouble is he's running in the wrong direction. Uh, he is the last hurrah of the old Democratic establishment. Uh, I don't think he's going to make it. I'd like to talk just a, a bit about you, sir. <clears throat> your books have been very successful now. Your, your opinions in foreign policy are being sought after by leaders in this country and elsewhere. It seems to be, in a sense, the resurrection of Richard Nixon. Does that help to heal the wounds? How does it make you feel? Yeah. Well, I'm not holding my breath for the resurrection. Uh, as far as uh, the public reaction is concerned, uh, I realize that uh, I have a lot of people out there who, uh, as has been the case throughout my political career, who uh, are very strongly antagonistic. Uh, I have some that are very supportive. and. Uh, at the present time, I appreciate uh, the one and respect the other. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what you do as you get a little older. A and as I sit here today, uh, 10 years after uh, the end of Vietnam, uh, almost 12 years since they left the presidency, I'm just thankful that I'm still alive and able to conduct an intelligent conversation mm -hmm. with a very tough questioner. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling, sir? We heard you had shingles and yeah. bad virus. I'm afraid this is going to disappoint all of my enemies out there because I'm afraid I'm going to outlive them. <laughs> <laughs> How is Mrs. Nixon feeling? Well, as I know she's one of your favorites. Yes, she's she's is. A, quite a remarkable person. Uh, I speak of what I've been through, but you know, for a woman to suffer in silence during the, the difficult last days in the White House and the days thereafter, which were even worse, is much more difficult. And then she's had two strokes. Uh, if you were to see her, you wouldn't know she'd had a stroke, but she doesn't have the stamina she once did. How would you like to be remembered? I suppose everyone would like to be remembered particularly for his major achievements. Uh, most people would point, for example, to the opening to China, which changed the world. Uh, but as I look back during the White House years, I think, for example, of, of an initiative which many people have forgotten, the Cancer Initiative. You remember we started that in 1971. And it was brought home to me just a couple of days ago. My brother, Don, has cancer. It's a very serious case. Uh, he's now taking radiation and chemotherapy. Ten years ago, his doctor told him he would be dead. So that initiative may have helped uh, prolong his life and the life of other cancer patients. Uh, what I'm suggesting here is that we all think of, well, he went to China. Uh, he ended the war in Vietnam. Uh, he opened relations with the Soviet Union through detente. But in my view, if the cancer initiative, which we began, could save lives, that'd be worth all the rest put together. Hugh, who would imagine that what he would want to be remembered for the most was his research on cancer? Yes, that's having surprising. nothing to do with politics. Is, uh, that's foreign policy, yeah. Surprise. Many people will remember your first interview with Richard Nixon in the early morning at a time when networks didn't do that unless it was on a pool basis, and you got one alone with him. It's a while ago. You've had a chance to observe the man now because you've done other interviews in between. In what ways do you perceive that he has changed since then? When you've got nothing to lose, you can afford to be very outspoken. This is a mellow Richard Nixon. Do you feel that he's rehabilitated? In terms of his foreign policy, 
Uh, who ever thought that 10 years ago after Watergate, anybody would ask his opinion on anything? When it comes to foreign policy, he is respected, maybe because that's our foreign policy is in somewhat of a vacuum. But in general, he, he still has his enemies. One thing, though, he's always interesting to talk to. Indeed.